Everything about Dura feels like barely contained chaos, and I mean that in a good way. From the ridiculous title to the wild improv jazz music to the giant cast of colorful characters all running in and out of each other's lives and stories. Dura is the story of, uh, I guess it's the story of a city. It's hard to really say that there's a main character or main group. Certain characters are definitely more important or more heavily featured than others, but can I really say that Mikado and his triumvirate of friends are more important than Selty and hers? Hell, I mean, there's even an argument for Isaiah being the main character, seeing how he basically controls everything that happens within the city and the lives of the people within it. Am I getting too far ahead of myself? Definitely. But this inability to name a true main character or plotline speaks even more to this series' chaotic nature. If I'm being honest, I really wasn't that big of a fan of episode 1. I thought it was an interesting enough introduction to Mikado, Masaomi, and the city of Ikebukuro as a whole, and it did enough to keep me watching, but I didn't really think of it as that gripping or memorable of an episode overall. It was really episode 2, an episode almost exclusively about a character that is never heard from or mentioned again after that episode ends, that really grabbed me. And I think episode 2 was a great example of what the series does so well. Taking the grand scope of big city life and narrowing the focus down to the specific individuals who inhabit it. Episode 2 was about a girl named Rio, who discovers that her father is cheating on her mother via some mysterious pictures that are delivered to her house. The episode details her descent into depression and detachment from her family as she grapples with the decision of whether or not to tell her mother and how to view her father after witnessing him in a different light. Throughout this period, she's in constant communication with the boy she only knows online, and after they grow a deep connection based on their mutual feelings of depression and isolation, he eventually convinces her to meet him out in the town for a nice night of double suicide in the city. You know, one of those plain Jane normal dates that people go on all the time. When she arrives at the location that they agreed upon, it turns out that the whole thing was a setup, and instead of meeting the boy, she gets kidnapped by a group of young thugs. Shortly after she's kidnapped, the thugs are confronted by a dark and mysterious woman who's basically just anime catwoman on a motorcycle, and she rescues the girl after beating the absolute bull out of the kidnappers. The woman on the motorcycle, whose name is Selty by the way, takes Rio to the man who hired Selty to rescue her. It turns out that the man who hired Selty is also the man who hired the men who kidnapped Rio, and he's also the same man who had been talking with her online for the past few months. This man's name is Isaiah, and this entire sequence that ensues after this reveal is the most unhinged, bat crazy, mind manipulation torture I have ever seen. My favorite part about this scene is that by the end, I genuinely couldn't tell if Isaiah was trying to help Ryo, hurt Ryo, or neither. It's the perfect balance of vitriol and important life lessons, all while he playfully dances at the ledge of the building that he's literally daring her to jump off of. And she does. Oh my god! Oh but right before she hits the ground, she's saved by the same mysterious woman who saved her before. And when she asks the mysterious woman why she saved her, the woman tells her that the world isn't as bad as she thinks it is. Then she rides off into the darkness of the night. And after this incredibly traumatic night, Rio starts to see the world differently. She realizes that everyone has their own lives to live and their own secrets that they keep, whether that be her father's infidelity or her own suicidal impulses. In a way, we're all sort of connected by the secrets that we keep, and knowing that allows her to find some happiness in her life. And it might sound like I'm rambling a little too much about this one episode, but this one episode is a perfect microcosm of everything I love about this series. The themes of love, loneliness, manipulation, secrets, serendipity, and violence are all present in this episode from start to finish, and it's these themes that are the driving force of the entire narrative as a whole. Needless to say, after episode 2, I was hooked on Dura, and after watching a man be falcon punched out of his goddamn outfit in broad daylight in episode 3, I was even more hooked. Dura has three running mysteries throughout the story of its first arc. One, where is Selty's head? Two, who runs the Dollars Gang? And three, what happened to the missing girl named Mika Harima? What you learn about Dura the more you watch is that nothing is quite as it seems. 
and everyone has their own deep, dark secrets and double lives that they lead. Different characters are involved in the hunt to uncover these different mysteries, but they all overlap in some way or another as the story unfolds. Mikado Ryugamine is a socially awkward freshman boy who just moved to Ikebukuro and is connecting with an old friend and classmate named Masaomi Kita. As soon as Mikado arrives in Ikebukuro, Masaomi gives him the rundown on who to avoid, how to act, and what to look out for around the city. Mikado is your standard weenie shonen protagonist who, despite his meager frame and social autism, has a surprisingly deep reserve of conviction and determination. His main goal is to connect with others and make his boring life a little bit more interesting, which is something that a lot of people move to big cities in order to do. So in that way, among others, he's a very relatable character. Selty is a headless fairy of death who hails from Ireland and rides a sentient motorcycle while making a living as a transporter in the city. She also lives with an overzealous doctor who loves her completely and unconditionally, so in that way, you could say that Selty is not a very relatable character. But that's not quite true. Selty's backstory isn't really relatable at all, that's definitely true. But her desperate search for identity, in this case literally looking for her head and face, is something that most people can relate to experiencing at some point in their lives, if not most of their lives. Another reason people migrate to big cities is to find themselves, to learn who they really are and what they really want out of life. Selty wants so bad to reclaim what she's lost, but Senji, the creepy doctor that she lives with, constantly tries to tell her, who she was doesn't matter because it's not who she is now. And who she is now is pretty goddamn amazing. Just another side note, I really love how Senji can read Selty's emotions and tell what she's thinking like a book despite her not having any facial expressions at all. Their relationship is like equal parts confusing, adorable, creepy, and hilarious. And it's one of my favorite aspects of the show. So many of the character plot lines and motivations come down to a desperate search or yearn for love. At the end of the day, that is what most people want, whether they realize it or not. Senji loves Selty, that one head with a dumb haircut loves Selty's head, that stalker girl loves the head with a dumb haircut who loves Selty's head, the sister of the head of Selty's head is in love with her brother in the weird hentai way, Masaomi loves that freaky gimp chick with busted ankles, Shizuo loves his brother in the normal not hentai way, and he's also afraid that no one will ever love him. And then Mikado loves Anri, even though Anri is struggling to understand love and her feelings of others in general. Oh yeah, and Isaiah quote, loves humans. Dura is basically one big f fest with little to no actual sex. I told you, f fest. Living in a city can leave people feeling so disconnected that the search for companionship grows stronger and stronger as time goes by. Of course, we all have goals that we want to reach, but true happiness is often found in having someone to share in those conquests with or maybe someone to console you when things don't go to plan and you fail. Despite our many differences and veering paths, it's the want and pursuit of love that really connects us all as people. As the story unfolds, the different threads and breadcrumbs that you're given in each episode start to paint a clear picture of what the hell is going on in this crazy ass city. There's gang wars, human trafficking, supernatural deities, and a whole lot of ass whoopings. It's a lot to take in, and it's an impossibly tall order to break down in a video like this. I really did love how this first arc of Dura ended. The Dollars Gang were constantly mentioned throughout the entire storyline, and characters would question the behavior of the gang and who was in charge so much that, naturally, it got me, the viewer, to question it as well. But no matter how much I thought about it, I never saw the twist of who the leader of the Dollars actually was coming until it happened. Mikado's final confrontation with the incest-loving bitch in the center of the city is such a great moment. When every member of the Dollars pulls out their phones and responds to Mikado's message, I was literally pumping my fist like a Jersey Shore douchebag for like three minutes straight in my living room. It really brought home the message of how much an impact the actions of one person can have on the world that they inhabit. For better or for worse, whether you bring people together like Mikado or tear them apart like Isaiah, the most beautiful and most terrifying thing about life in the big city is just how powerful any one person can be at any time. And with those 12 episodes, a beautiful cluster of a story is wrapped up perfectly. Oh, wait, there's still like a whole other half to it? No oh, sh**. Yeah, I really hate to say it. I mean, really hate to say it, but uh, I 
don't like the second half of Dura much at all. Don't get me wrong, I like what they tried to do with Masaomi and Anri, you know, like fleshing them out and giving them more story, but even though it had some cool moments like Shizuo fighting the zombies uh, and some other just cool parts here and there, I have one huge problem with Dura, and it starts and ends with this loser right here. I hate Masaomi. He might be my least favorite anime character of all time. And the crazy thing is, I didn't always hate him from the beginning of the show. I thought he was fine as the goofy, horny, yet supportive and fun-loving best friend to the main characters. It's when they tried to make him more than that, that I started to be like, This is bullshit. Making Masaomi some big bad former gang leader who left the streets in self-exile to live a normal life as a normal high school student would be the equivalent of My Hero Academia trying to turn Mineta into some super powerful villain who rivals Deku in power level. By the way, I'm only like halfway through season 4 of My Hero Academia. Please tell me Mineta does not become some super powerful villain that rivals Deku in power level. It's just not believable to me that this gang of violent thugs would follow, respect, or cower in fear of this bozo. I hate to say it, but Masaomi's storyline in the second half of the show completely ruined that part of the story for me, and damn near ruined the first part for me as well. I hated the ending of this series so much, like legitimately, I was in a funk for like a week where I just refused to watch any new anime. I also wasn't crazy about the whole Saika storyline with Anri. It definitely wasn't as stupid as Masaomi's story, but man, it started to feel like complete nonsense after a while. And Dura already has a lot of ridiculous and nonsensical aspects to its story, but the Psycho stuff was just boring, which is the worst kind of nonsense a story can have. And having these two plot lines be the main focus of the climax of the entire series just made it all so hard to sit through. But that's the negatives of chaotic storytelling. It's all well and good for a narrative to bounce all over the place and constantly keep you on your toes with different twists and reveals, but when a story overstays its welcome, those crazy twists start to feel pretty forced and uninspired, and it's easy for a viewer like myself to lose interest pretty quickly. It makes me think about the end of a suspiciously similar series called Bacano. How do you think our friend has spent his time up to now running around this earth? And what sort of experiences do you think he will have from here on? <laughs> Visualize, Carol. Imagine. Maybe the thrill of not knowing the ending and imagining who all these characters continued to live their lives as after the script ended would have been better than the actual reality of what their stories ended up being. One of the best qualities a writer can have is knowing when to end a great story. I just wish Dura was one of those cases. Damn shame. Damn shame.